Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is April 27, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 45. This evening the last in a ten-part special series of reports called Second to None was shown on ABC's World News Tonight program. For two entire weeks the series has drummed away night after night about America's military weakness compared to Russia. Full-page newspaper ads have urged viewers to watch the series. So have various newspaper articles. And the series itself has carried so much impact that it has made an indelible impression on millions of Americans. Most of all, the nine-minute installment on April 17 describing the outbreak of nuclear war between Russia and America left many viewers badly shaken. The frightening picture painted in the ABC News series is accurate as far as it goes, but it also would have been accurate three to four years ago. We were not shown these things then, so the question is, why now? One reason that has been given is that we might be about to sign the SALT II Treaty with Russia and that we ought to look before we leap. But if that were the real reason, a series like this should have been shown more than 18 months ago because that is when SALT I expired and the air was full of promises of a new SALT Treaty then. My friends, the people who put together the ABC documentary series did a very good job indeed. But the reason our Bolshevik rulers want it to be shown now is to help add to the atmosphere of war tensions. They also want to make sure that SALT II, if it is signed, will generate a storm of controversy and be defeated in the Senate. If that happens, it will be like closing the door to peace and telling the world that war with Russia is inevitable. In more and more ways the atmosphere of mounting crisis and the threat of war is being stoked up by the Bolsheviks here in America. The low drum beat of Bring Back the Draft keeps coming back over and over a little louder each time. The specter of gas rationing keeps haunting the news as the artificial crisis in the Middle East heats up. For example, Former Defense Secretary Melvin Laird now says the government should institute gas rationing just to make the crisis seem more real to people. Can you imagine? My friends, I realize that today, as in the past, many people are skeptical about what I have to reveal. After all, these things are probably contrary to what they have heard from friends, family, teachers, and the news media. They do not have my intelligence sources and if I were to reveal these sources, they would dry up. But I believe that my duty is simply to reveal the truth, not cover it up just because it may be hard to accept. This month events have been moving very fast in startling ways. Four days ago I said over the Ed Bush Show on WFAA Dallas, Texas, that the takeover here in the United States has already taken place. The people you will see on your television screens are not the people you think they are. Now I can say more. My three topics this month are Topic No. 1, the domestic Guyana at Three Mile Island. Topic No. 2, the secret intelligence war of doubles. And Topic No. 3, Last Call for a Pilgrimage for Peace. Topic No. 1. As dawn was breaking over Pennsylvania 30 days ago on March 28, it looked like the beginning of just another ordinary day. It was a Wednesday, and there were jobs to go to, schools to attend, errands to run. The streets of Harrisburg, the capital city, were coming to life as people began their day's activities. East of the city the rich farmlands of the Pennsylvania Dutch country were coming to life with the bloom of spring. For generations the Pennsylvania Dutch have been famous for their life close to God and far from modern technology. But on that Wednesday morning of March 28, 1979, the Pennsylvania Dutch were completing their first year with a landmark of modern technology almost on their doorstep. It was a Three Mile Island nuclear power plant located in the Susquehanna River southeast of Harrisburg. 
In the first rays of morning light the distinctive outlines of the nuclear plant gave no hint of the danger within it. The plant appeared quiet and peaceful, in fact quieter than normal. Two of the four giant cooling towers 37 stories high had stopped belching steam. That meant one of the two nuclear reactors on the island had been shut down for some reason, and in fact some residents near the power plant had been awakened in the pre-dawn hours by a thundering roar of escaping steam. But no one seemed to be really worried. A few minutes before 7 a.m. someone close to the plant might have detected the first clear signal that something ominous was happening. An emergency siren began to wail, telling workers to abandon immediately certain critical areas of the power plant. Several workers made a dash for their cars in an attempt to escape. Two cars raced out of the power plant site across the bridge to freedom. Then the gate was closed to make sure no one else could leave. A few minutes later at 7.02 a.m. officials of Metropolitan Edison called the Dolphin County Civil Defense Authorities. A site emergency had just been declared at the nuclear power plant. By this time Three Mile Island Plant No. 2 had already been in a state of growing crisis for more than three hours, and for nearly an hour the computer designed to monitor conditions inside the reactor had been printing question marks instead of numbers. The reactor was overheating so badly that the computer system could no longer measure the temperatures. It had all begun shortly after 3 a.m. when trouble developed in a key water pump. Soon the pump failed, halting the flow of water to the steam-driven power turbine. Automatic devices immediately shut down the turbine in a situation known as a turbine trip. Superheated steam at enormous pressures was diverted from the turbine and vented to the outside, producing the thunderous roar that wakened nearby residents. At the same time other automatic devices were shutting down the nuclear reactor itself in a so-called scram that is, a rapid emergency shutdown. Normally when a nuclear reactor is started up or shut down it is done gradually. This allows temperatures throughout the reactor to rise or fall gently, avoiding thermal stresses that might do damage. It also allows the startup or shutdown process to be monitored carefully at every step to make sure nothing unexpected happens. But on that Wednesday morning of March 28, there was no time for all that. With a pump failure and turbine trip, the nuclear reactor was left producing enormous quantities of heat that had no place to go, so the automatic control system scrammed the reactor. Within seconds all the reactor's control rods were dropped into the core to make the fission chain reaction die away. But even with the rods in place, the hot reactor was still generating heat at a slower rate. So to cool it down the automatic control system turned on three big standby pumps. Two were meant to flood the reactor core with cooling water, while the third had a related safety purpose. The three pumps roared to life, but nothing happened. There was no water for them to pump, because before the episode began someone had turned off the valves ahead of the pumps. It was far more than a mere breach of regulations. Shutting those valves was an act that could not have been more expertly calculated to bring on a potential catastrophe. All three valves were closed, thereby defeating the redundancy which was built into the backup systems for safety purposes. It was an unthinkable thing to do. It threatened a power plant worth nearly $1 billion with possible destruction. It threatened untold thousands of lives and if done by an employee, it even threatened the life of whoever closed the valves. It was, in short, a kamikaze act of sabotage. But perhaps because it was so unthinkable, it worked. A number of workers have stated that they noticed the valves closed and tagged in the days just before March 28, and everyone who worked in the vicinity of the valves knew very well how critical they were. So the tendency was to assume that there must be some good reason why they had been closed. After all, they even had tags to show that they were closed. It was an obvious and serious violation of safety procedures, but it seemed unthinkable that this could be unauthorized and deliberate. And so the valves remained closed, 
and no one did anything to correct the situation. In this way the stage was set for Wednesday, March 28, 1979. As the reactor was scrammed, the backup pumps screamed in vain, trying to draw water through valves that were closed. No fresh water went to the reactor to cool it. Pressures built up in the reactor, and a safety valve popped open. Superheated, radioactive water began flashing out of the reactor into the huge concrete containment dome, and the water level started dropping in the reactor itself. Then the valve stuck open instead of closing as it was supposed to do. Radioactive water kept right on gushing out of the reactor. Strangely, it was more than two hours before the control room button was pushed to stop radioactive water from escaping. My friends, all this was going on while neighbors of Three Mile Island were drifting back to sleep. They had been awakened by the brief roar of vented steam when the turbine tripped, but then all had quieted down again. All seemed peaceful and normal again around the nuclear power plant, but inside the control room of Three Mile Island No. 2, klaxons were blaring, alarms were ringing, and trouble lights were flashing. The reactor was fast losing water and heating up rapidly. Soon the last-ditch emergency cooling system automatically turned on, but within a few minutes one of the emergency pumps was shut off by person or persons unknown for unexplained reasons. Six minutes later the same was done to the other emergency cooling pump. Once again redundant emergency systems had been thwarted by human intervention. Soon. There was a radioactive pool of water on the floor of the huge containment dome where it had spilled out of the reactor. Sump pumps began sucking the water out of there into a nearby auxiliary building which is not equipped to seal in radioactive materials. From there radioactive materials soon began to filter outside to be carried downwind. Strangely enough, while pumps critical to safety were being turned off right and left, the one pump that should have been turned off, the sump pump, was left running. As a result, it was guaranteed that radiation from the reactor would find its way outside to contaminate the countryside. Within 20 minutes after the episode began, someone discovered that all the water to the reactor had been cut off and took corrective action. Cooling water began rushing into the reactor, and for a while the situation was under control, but within an hour the unthinkable happened again. All four water pumps were quietly turned off again, and the reactor started heating up fast. Soon the monitoring computer began printing question marks. Thousands of small cylinders of uranium fuel in the reactor began coming apart at the seams with heat. Highly radioactive uranium and fission products bubbled out of the reactor with the still escaping water. At 7.02 a.m. the first call was placed to Civil Defense. By 7.20 a.m. Metropolitan Edison had to call Civil Defense officials again. Radiation levels in the containment dome were skyrocketing, and now the Three Mile Island situation had been upgraded to a general emergency. Yet to the public at large there still was no word that anything was wrong at Three Mile Island. Thousands of commuters in Harrisburg drove to work without a hint on their car radios that anything unusual was taking place. Mothers hurried to get their children packed off to school on time. Farmers in the neighboring countryside set about their daily chores without giving the nuclear plant a second thought. Meanwhile, traces of radioactive uranium and fission products from the crippled reactor were already wafting downwind and beginning to contaminate the Pennsylvania landscape for miles around. It was not until 9.06 a.m., more than five hours after the episode began, that any public notice of the emergency was given. It was a brief report over the Associated Press newswire marked urgent to the effect that a general emergency was underway at Three Mile Island. From then on Three Mile Island became like a domestic Guyana story, and in more ways than one. Like Guyana, it captured the headlines for a week and more. Like Guyana, it seemed unthinkable, and yet there it was, right before our eyes. 
Just as with Guiana, news stories about the events at Three Mile Island were marked by confusion. And in Pennsylvania, as in Guyana, large numbers of innocent American civilians were the victims. In Guyana, they were poisoned by means of potassium cyanide. In Pennsylvania, thousands have been poisoned by varying amounts of radioactive uranium and its fission products such as xenon and krypton gases. Right now doctors in the vicinity of the Three Mile Island are reporting many patients who are now exhibiting symptoms such as nausea, headaches, diarrhea, nervousness, insomnia, and eye trouble. Many doctors are not aware of it, but these are among the classic symptoms of low-level radiation poisoning. The government is telling a half-truth in saying that the contamination from Three Mile Island should not lead to an increase in cancer. The reason is that the particular elements released in the nuclear accident do not cause cancer but other disorders. The word cancer, for that matter, has been turned into a medical scare word that hides more than it reveals. Cancer is a Latin word meaning crab. It is used to describe a certain kind of growth or tumor that grows with tentacles in various directions, giving it a crab-like appearance. What makes cancer so frightening is that it grows fast, consuming healthy tissue as it goes. So any tumor that grows rapidly is labeled as cancer, while tumors that remain stable or grow very slowly are usually called benign. In the 1920s Dr. Otto Warburg earned the Nobel Prize for determining exactly what cancer really is. He was able to prove that the malady called cancer is just a condition of blocked cell oxidation. Today, more than 50 years later, we hear year in and year out about new ideas about what cancer might be. Meanwhile, Warburg's conclusive findings of long ago are ignored. Billions of dollars and millions of lives have been wasted over the years in efforts to figure out how to kill cancer when it occurs. The reality, my friends, is that cancer is itself the conversion of normal tissue into a kind of living death. True elimination of cancer can only be achieved not by agents of death, but by restoring life. In the area surrounding Three Mile Island, though, cancer is not the problem. Uranium and its derivatives can produce a fungus that leads to lumps and tumors which often are misdiagnosed as cancer. If the fungus enters the bloodstream, it produces a disease known as cystic fibrosis. With this disease the entire body undergoes weakening and gradual degeneration. It often strikes children and is usually considered fatal. The best protection against these disorders produced by radiation, as well as against cancer and other diseases, is to make sure your body cells are provided with the things they need to stay healthy. A key to this lies in four key minerals which need to be in proper balance in your body at all times. The therapeutic value of these minerals was established by Dr. Wilhelm Schuschler of Basel, Switzerland a century ago and has been confirmed in countless ways since then. In order of importance these four are potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sodium. It is best to obtain these four minerals in as non-toxic a form as possible. Ordinary table salt, for example, is sodium chloride, an inorganic poison to the cell. It has to be detoxified by the liver and companion organs of the body before assimilation. Likewise, many forms of potassium are toxic, even though potassium is vital to good health. So it is important to uh, get these minerals in an organic form such as citrate, gluconate, or oyster shells. In the United States proper supplements like these are especially important because most American food is badly demineralized, and this is most true of potassium, the most vital mineral of all. The episode of Three Mile Island blanketed hundreds of square miles and possibly a million people with low-level radiation, but the miracle is that it was not much worse than it was, for most of the radioactive materials released during the episode are still confined to the power plant site itself. 
The huge concrete containment dome around the reactor became so radioactive inside that no one could enter it without dying almost instantly, and the reactor itself was damaged so badly that today, 30 days later, the shutdown of the reactor is just reaching its final stages. The damage and contamination at Three Mile Island Plant No. 2 are so extreme that there are serious doubts as to whether it can ever be cleaned up and used again. Already there have been suggestions by some that it should be encased in a tomb of concrete and abandoned. My friend, that is an echo of the suggestion I made about the United States Bullion Depository at Fort Knox three and one half years ago in AUDIO LETTER no. V. The depository had been contaminated by a leaking radioactive CIA super poison secretly stored there, and it remains contaminated to this day. Three Mile Island has proven that there are great potential hazards from nuclear power plants, but those proven hazards lie in the area of vulnerability to sabotage that can produce terrible consequences. The available evidence strongly indicates that the emergency at Three Mile Island was not an accident. It was a criminal act. Its effect is to help speed up the plan to shut down American freedoms by means of energy shortages, economic disruptions, and government controls. Five months ago in AUDIO LETTER no. 40 I revealed in detail how hundreds of American civilians had been deliberately sacrificed by the American Government in Guyana and why. I warned then that the gruesome tragedy at Jonestown, Guyana, is only a pale shadow of what lies ahead for the entire United States if the cancer of Bolshevism is not stopped. And now a domestic Guyana has taken place at Three Mile Island. A completely unnatural sequence of events took place, causing a nuclear crisis to take place which had never even been analyzed in official studies. Those responsible, the Bolsheviks among us, were hoping to achieve a full-fledged disaster at Three Mile Island with massive releases of radiation. This would have killed many people outright, sickened many more, and required a mass evacuation of several counties in the Harrisburg area. That would have accomplished two things. For one thing, it would have increased the general air of crisis, of emergency, and of a need for decisive Federal action, but more importantly, it would have turned all nuclear power plants into objects of fear and hate by the American public. This would have justified an immediate shutdown of all 70 nuclear power plants across the United States. In one blow America would have lost 13 percent of its electric power. The virtual rationing of electricity by various means would have followed quickly as one means of tightening governmental control over American life. But the Three Mile Island episode never quite reached the level of catastrophe except in terms of damage to the power plant itself. And so the Bolshevik plan for now is to settle for half a loaf. Three Mile Island Plant No. 2 was built by a company named Babcock & Wilcox, which has also built eight other nuclear plants, including the No. 1 plant on Three Mile Island. So the plan now is to blame that company in various ways and to shut down those eight plants, as was ordered today by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. In the areas affected, the cutbacks in electric power will have the disruptive effects planned by the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks' scheme to rob America of part of its electric power by shutting down the nuclear plants is elaborate. In recent months controversy over nuclear power has been stirred up to unprecedented levels, and in mid-March two actions were taken to set the stage for Three Mile Island. First, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission abruptly shut down five plants in the Northeast ostensibly over earthquake worries. Then the movie The China Syndrome was released, and, my friends, there is more to come. By means of Bolshevik coup d'etat and revolution, an international group who were once more powerful than the Rockefellers are making a new bid for power here in America. But the outcome in the turbulent events now going on behind the scenes is impossible to predict, because there is now a clandestine war going on involving not one 
but several major intelligence agencies. The prize? Control of America. Topic No. 2 Long before the American Revolution for Independence, a famous principle was formulated in Europe. It was, quote, Give me the power to issue a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws." Unquote. The man who originated this dictum used it to launch a family dynasty of unprecedented wealth and power. His name? Mayor Amschild Rothschild. The power of the Rothschilds, or Rothschilds as many people call them, grew fast in Britain and Europe. By the time of the American Revolution, the financial affairs, especially of Britain and France, were in the Rothschild pocket. The taxation schemes which brought on the Revolution actually originated not with King George but in the house of Rothschild. After the Revolution, Rothschild agents were on hand to try to return America to Rothschild control. One of the most powerful of these was Alexander Hamilton but his maneuverings were ended by the famous duel with Aaron Burr. America managed to steer clear of Rothschild control until the Civil War provided a new opportunity. In AUDIO LETTER No. 26 I mentioned how Russia, then the greatest Christian nation on earth, came to America's rescue in 1863. Britain and France were preparing to dismantle the United States, but Russia prevented it. For that and other reasons, the Rothschilds thereafter marked Russia for utter destruction. At the same time, the Rothschilds were determined to take over America and decided to do it by promoting powerful groups already within our country. The era of America's robber barons was spawned, and with it a new super dynasty, the Rockefellers. By 1917, Rockefeller power in America had become so great that they were strong partners with their former mentors, the Rothschilds. The Bolshevik cancer to destroy Russia was a Rothschild creation, but it was the Rockefeller interests who actually injected that cancer into Russia. As the 20th century progressed, the power of the aging Rothschild dynasty finally was eclipsed by that of the upstart Rockefellers. Where Rothschild power had begun with the control of money, Rockefeller power was rooted in the control of energy, and with Saudi Arabia in their grasp after World War II, the Rockefellers soon began to outdistance all rival power groups worldwide, including the Rothschilds. But my friends, the Rothschild interests bided their time. They waited for the Rockefellers to start making mistakes, and not long ago it began happening. In AUDIO LETTERS No. 38 and elsewhere, I have described how the atheistic Bolsheviks who used to run Russia have recently been overthrown. This final overthrow is the culmination of six decades of determined effort by a tough, tightly knit band of Russian Christians. When the final phase of undisguised overthrow began two to three years ago, it was the Rothschilds, not the Rockefellers, who learned about it first. For 60 years the Rockefellers had been secret allies of the old Bolsheviks in Russia, but the Rockefellers were sadly mistaken in their belief that they actually controlled the Bolsheviks. Instead, it was always the Rothschilds who secretly controlled the Bolsheviks in Russia and who now control them here in the United States. In the past, the interests of the Rockefellers and Rothschilds always coincided well enough that this distinction did not really matter, but after the Battle of the Harvest Moon, which I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, everything changed. Recently I explained the fatal mistake which the four Rockefeller brothers made in their panic following the Battle of the Harvest Moon. That mistake was to open America's doors to the old line Bolsheviks who are being expelled from Russia now. It was a suicidal act for the Rockefellers because their own corporate socialist empire could not hope to coexist with those satanic state socialists, the Bolsheviks. 
but the Rockefellers accepted the recommendations of certain advisors to do so, and those advisors, my friends, were Rothschild agents. During the past several months a Bolshevik coup d'etat has taken the lives of all four of the Rockefeller brothers, as I have made public in my tapes. The Rothschild interests of today are making a desperate bid to regain their former status as the world's number one power group, and they are doing it through their own forces of Bolshevism. Last month I tried to warn the remaining members of the Rockefeller family that they must join forces and act now to stop what is happening. If they do take action as I said last month, they could help save not only themselves but all of us here in America. But if they do not act, and quickly, they will suffer the historic fate of all overthrown dynastic families. They will all be tracked down and killed by their Bolshevik enemies. So far, I'm sorry to report, the Rockefeller survivors remain fragmented and neutralized, persuaded wrongly that they do not have enough power to act. And now, my friends, another prominent member of the Rockefeller family has been killed, murdered near Paris, France, but a double has already been substituted. My friends, if the Bolshevik coup d'etat and coming full-scale revolution are successful, our land faces a future of agony and despair. Christians will have to hide their Bibles and hope for some day long in the future when it will be safe to read them once again. When the Bolshevik Revolution swept across Russia six decades ago, that was the way it was. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a thorn in the side for the atheistic Bolsheviks and their hatred for Him will be expressed in merciless persecution of His followers. No doubt about that. There are those who say today America is too big. No one could take over our whole country. But, my friends, the continental United States has only four time zones. Sixty-two years ago smaller numbers of Bolshevik revolutionaries, using cruder techniques than today, succeeded in taking control of Russia, and Russia spreads almost halfway round the world with 11 time zones. The Bolsheviks, doing the bidding of the Rothschilds, are working fast, and yet in recent days the situation has become much more complicated than before. The struggle for control of America has now mushroomed into a secret intelligence war involving not one but several major intelligence agencies of the world. Where it is all leading is by no means clear right now. All I can do at this point is to report the facts to you and urge you to keep your eyes open. At the present time, for example, the Bolsheviks are planning to ignite a Middle East crisis around mid-May. The Pope's Revolution was also planned for May when I first made the plan public in AUDIO LETTER No. 42 but that has now been pushed back to June. But these and other plans have been thrown into question by recent eruption of intelligence warfare by means of doubles, look-alikes, and impostors. For example, earlier this month on April 11, Vice President Walter Mondale reportedly left Washington on a trip to Iceland, Scandinavia, and the Netherlands. But, my friends, the man and woman on Air Force Two were not Mondale and his wife, but actually doubles. The real Walter and Joan Mondale had been spirited away. The following day Jimmy Rosalind and Amy Carter, the real ones, left the White House for a 10-day Easter vacation in Georgia. The first eight days were to be spent offshore in seclusion at Sapelo Island. Carter was looking more haggard by the day, racked by leukemia and multiple cancers. His visible loss of weight lately had prompted cover stories about his alleged success at dieting. He was fast losing the ability to work at all, and news stories said he was going to Georgia to seek solitude. And so for a week and a half surrounding Easter, the President and Vice President of the United States were out of public view, 
A few low-key reports appeared in the papers about the alleged activities of Mondale on his trip. Otherwise all was quiet here in Washington. The real purpose of the trip by Mondale's Bolshevik double was to try to obtain oil for Israel, but in this the Mondale double failed because very recently Russia's Marshal Dmitry Ustinov, the man now in charge in the Kremlin, had visited Norway personally, and Norway has now come to terms with Russia. The weekend after Easter things happened fast, completely unseen by the public. On Friday night, April 20, the real Walter Mondale was being held incommunicado by Bolshevik captors in New Richmond in western Wisconsin. Sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. local time, Vice President Walter Mondale was executed. Mondale had been one of Nelson Rockefeller's closest political allies and had been prominent among the mourners at Rockefeller's memorial service at Riverside Church in early February. Now he had died on a Friday evening, as Rockefeller had at almost the same local time and from the same cause, a bullet in the forehead. Barely an hour later Mondale's body was dumped into Lake Superior at a point about 12 miles southeast of Tagonite Harbor, Minnesota. Meanwhile Air Force II was already on its way westward across the Atlantic with the Mondale Double aboard. Mondale had been scheduled to return on Sunday, according to public announcements, but his plane was returning a day early for security reasons, but it did no good. Air Force II, a duplicate of Air Force I flown by the President, was a specially outfitted military Boeing 707 known as a VC-137C. Its remains, all except for the left wing, are now lying under thousands of feet of water in the North Atlantic. The navigational coordinates are 57, 30, 35 north. 26, 38, 20 west. That's about 150 miles north of where the Kissinger jet crashed in February. The left wing of Air Force II is lying on the ocean floor about 13 miles to the east of the rest of the plane. The flight crew were unable to radio details, but a blast close to the fuselage tore off practically the entire left wing in flight. The wing fluttered away like a leaf while the rest of the plane spiraled downward seven miles into the sea. At present Mondale's office claims that he returns Sunday, April 22 at 1 p.m., but the next person you see in the news as Mondale will be his second double, recruited to fill in for the first double who died in a North Atlantic crash of Air Force II. A replacement for Air Force II will no doubt appear as soon as one can be outfitted. On Saturday, April 21, Jimmy Carter flew secretly from Georgia to Camp David, unaware that Mondale was dead. After lunch he went to Bethesda Naval Hospital for a checkup on his cancer and then to the White House briefly. It was not until roughly 8 p.m. that night that the real Jimmy Carter returned to Plains. There about 10.30 p.m., Jimmy Carter, President of the United States, was shot between the eyes, but incredibly he retained some signs of life. He was rushed from planes to Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington, arriving shortly after midnight. By 2 a.m. Sunday, April 22, he was in surgery at Bethesda Naval Hospital, but it was hopeless, just as it was in 1963 when President Kennedy was shot in the head. With Rosalind Carter in shock, the body of the late President of the United States was disposed of quickly. That evening the real Rosalind Carter was at the White House under heavy sedation, but shortly after midnight she too was executed with a bullet between the eyes. During the past several days Jimmy Carter No. 2, that is Carter's double, has been seen repeatedly in public, and what a change! Jimmy Carter No. 2 looks and acts ten years younger than the real Carter did. Listen now to the tired, halting voice of the old Carter as he read a prepared statement just 17 days ago on April 10. 
we have already begun to hear a good deal of talk from the oil companies about so-called plowbacks. But what this talk covers up is that this proposal, as it will be presented with the windfall profits tax, already provides $6 billion in increased revenue. Now compare that with the more shrill voice, forceful, vigorous, and confident of Carter No. 2 just two days ago on April the 25th. The bottom line is that if there is an effort to cheat on the SALT agreement, including the limits on modernizing ICBMs, we will detect it. My friends, the flat, awkward speaking style of the old Carter is gone. In its place is a new style of delivery which imitates the old Carter but has better phrasing and more lively inflection of the voice. The eyes, which were becoming glazed with pain and sedative, are now gone, and in their place are eyes that are piercing and alert. Gone is the old Carter under siege. In his place is a man who is talking about storming the country by entering every Democratic Presidential primary in the nation, but he is making do with only a weak imitation of that most famous of all Carter campaign assets, the face-splitting Carter grin. The change in appearance and behavior are so striking that something had to be done to focus people's attention in a way that would explain it all away, in other words, distraction. And so the new Jimmy Carter, the double, is receiving great publicity over the fact that he parts his hair on the left. The old Carter, of course, parted it on the right, so now anyone who looks at him and thinks, Carter sure looks different these days, will also think, I guess it's the hair that does it. My friends, strange things are going on, and you should prepare yourself for big surprises in the days ahead. Besides the clandestine services of the United States and the Royal Shield interests, there are at least three other factions secretly busy here now. These are the intelligence agencies of Russia, Great Britain, and Israel. Within the past two months, Britain has secretly come to terms with Russia, and the Russian underwater missiles around Britain have been removed, and the doubles for Jimmy and Rosalind Carter have been at the Russian Embassy here in Washington a great deal this past week, avoiding the White House as much as possible. One thing, my friends, is certain. Whatever these things mean, the Russians are taking it all very seriously. Since last Sunday, April 22, there have been 24 Russian Cosmospheres deployed over the Washington metropolitan area. Something important is afoot, and however it turns out, the Russians intend to be ready. Topic No. 3. One week ago today, April 20, was Lenin's birthday. In the past it has always been a day that demanded a properly reverent attitude on the part of all Russians. But things are changing in Russia today. Brezhnev No. 2, the double who replaced the real Brezhnev after his death in January 1978, is used today to convey Russian policy positions to the world, and this year Brezhnev No. 2 was conspicuous by his absence from Lenin Day celebrations. Instead, he went to a hockey match, and one which had little significance to Russia whose team was not one of those playing. It was a graphic way of saying, in effect, Lenin doesn't live here anymore. Meanwhile other members of the Russian leadership were given signals about what does matter in Russia today. The hockey game attended by Brezhnev No. 2 was taking place on Good Friday as reckoned in Russia. At the time, a Congressional delegation from the United States was in Moscow, meeting with leaders including Prime Minister Kosygin and Foreign Minister Gromyko. In James Reston's New York Times article of April 24, 1979, some surprising behavior by the Russian leaders is mentioned. Quote, Paradoxically, they arranged with a congressman on Easter weekend to go into the old Christian churches at Sizran and watch 
if not take part in the ceremony of the Resurrection." Unquote. More than a week earlier the Easter season had begun in Moscow in a way that stunned many outside observers. On the evenings of April 13 and 14 the Moscow Conservatory, the most important concert hall in Moscow, was packed with capacity crowds. They were there to hear something not heard in Russia since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. They were there to hear Handel's Messiah, and in the capital city of the land our leaders want us to hate, the Moscow Conservatory thundered with those triumphant words of the Hallelujah Chorus, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. In an interview by the British Broadcasting Corporation on February 3, exiled Russian author Alexander Solzhenitsyn said he wants to return to Russia. He says there is a rejuvenation of society going on there now, and no wonder. During the Easter season just past, the Russians have been celebrating not only the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, they have also been celebrating the resurrection of Christianity itself in Russia. My friends, it's a fact that Russia is no longer ruled by Satanic Bolsheviks, but by native Russian Christians. Yet it is also a fact that the Kremlin today is in command of the most powerful military machine the world has ever known. Russian underwater missiles are poised within our own territorial waters ready for launch in a devastating nuclear strike at a moment's notice. Russian submarines armed partly with neutron weapons now patrol continuously along our east, west, and Gulf coasts. Russian charged particle beam weapons are on the moon, in Earth orbit, and on floating electrogravitic platforms over our country. Our major dams and many other targets have been sabotaged with hydrogen bombs which are already in place ready for detonation upon Satellite Command. If the Kamikaze War plans of our Bolshevik rulers are not stopped, there is no question what the outcome will be. All of America will be turned into a funeral pyre, and the American dream will end in a nightmare. Looking at all this, ever so often someone asks me, if the rulers of Russia today are Christians, why would they want to hurt us? much less kill us. My friends, to begin with, their actions have already proven that they do not have a desire to destroy us at all. Over a year and a half ago Russia defeated the United States in the still secret space battle of the Harvest Moon. Ever since then Russia has been increasingly in a position to destroy America at will, but the Russians have not done it in spite of continuing treachery by America's Satanic rulers. As I detailed last September in AUDIO LETTER No. 38, the rulers of Russia do plan to wipe Bolshevism off the face of the earth. Even so, it's now clear that if they find a way to do it without resorting to full-scale war, they will try to do it. But the problem is that our own rulers, who are now the Bolsheviks, are making war increasingly unavoidable. First, the Bolsheviks want to bring us all under their own total dictatorship. Then they will be able to mold America into a much more efficient war machine than it is now, and under the conditions of Bolshevik dictatorship you and I will be powerless to stop it. Russia's rulers will then be faced with only two possible choices. One choice will be to allow Russia's people, who have suffered beyond belief at the hands of the Bolsheviks, to suffer again when the American nuclear first strike is launched. The only other choice will be to put America out of action. In that case, untold millions of American Christians will be killed, but the attitude of Russia's rulers is that if we allow the Bolsheviks to carry things that far, we will have only ourselves to blame. Last month I proposed that a pilgrimage for peace to Moscow be formed by American Christian leaders. Its purpose would be to begin building bridges of trust between the peoples of Russia and America, 
as the only real foundation for peace and friendship. I appeal to Christian leaders of all denominations and at all levels to respond in great numbers by April 30. In that way there was a chance Russia's rulers could be proven wrong in their conviction that America's churches are infiltrated by Bolshevism. Now, my friends, it is time to report the results. In all of the United States there have been only a tiny handful of independent-minded pastors and church officials who have responded. There is no chance that such a tiny group would convince the Kremlin of anything, and so I am forced now to repeat the question I asked in AUDIO LETTER No. 21, and that is, where, oh where, are the churches today? But there is still a ray of hope, my friends. My call for a pilgrimage for peace last month was directed only to church leaders who, for the most part, have not responded. Yet there has been a spontaneous outpouring of interest from lovers of our Lord Jesus Christ and all other walks of life. Therefore, I am hereby expanding my proposal for a pilgrimage for peace. The name Christian originally meant Christ One, that is, anyone who loved and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I am appealing to all Christ Ones in all walks of life. Would you be willing to join me in a pilgrimage for peace to Russia? Do you want Russia's Christian rulers of today to understand that there is still a backbone of decency, honesty, and truth in America? Would you be willing to spend some of your time and money on a pilgrimage to Russia if it might prevent thermonuclear war? My friends, if you could participate in a pilgrimage for peace in any way, please contact me by the end of May 1979. If you could go yourself or if you could help sponsor someone else to go, please let me know. To streamline things as much as possible, please do not call, but write to me here at 1629 K Street, Northwest. That's the letter K, Washington, D.C., ZIP 2006. Write the word Pilgrimage in the lower left corner of the envelope. Please give your name, address, telephone number, occupation, and whether you are available to go yourself or to sponsor someone else. It remains to be seen whether Russia's rulers will approve such a visit, but I believe that depends mostly on you. If they see that the people of America truly want peace and trust and friendship, I believe their response will be favorable. But if they are not convinced that we are serious, there will be no pilgrimage. And the consequences for America and the world will be very grave. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.